Greetings, dear Hawks. I am so glad that you have tuned in to this topic on our YouTube site. Believe me, everybody who comes into this world and adopts its human state is very, very concerned about this issue. Is there an afterlife? And have you got proof of it? Are there sightings of it? And so I'm going to talk with you about my experiences with the afterlife. And just so that I don't keep you in suspense or anything like that, if you're asking me, hey Bob, is there an afterlife? Yes. Uh, is it good stuff? Yes. Absolutely no worry. Seen it, done it, been there, waiting to be able to be called back to it. It's good stuff. Now, does that mean it's going to convince you? No. But will it put some support onto you? Yes. What will convince you? When you've had your own experiences and your own blessings from it, and now you feel it with inside yourself. That's what will give you the proof of it. <clears throat> so, I'm going to give you some supportive evidence of the afterlife existence and the qualities of it of God's qualities of how he produced this as well in order to end your fears. And the first things that I'm going to quote is out of the foot ladder of Notes Divine. Now, old time as you know what that is, the foot ladder of Notes Divine is God's dictation to me, which is found on Christian Laity Foundation dot org. Laity spelt L A I T Y Christian Laity Foundation dot org. And this has been a curriculum of healings over what is now some 13, 14 years of messages which are of a daily nature to me, following me very, very carefully as God lays out day after day after day the healings that are needed and the support, the repetitions of the healings that we all need in order to keep reminding of us so that we have enough experiences, enough memories of this to be able to use them. So I'm going to use, as the beginning of this, the foot ladder of Notes Divine. And I'm going to use first two messages from the foot ladder. And then we'll comment on them and then I'm going to do another one or two from it. Because here is God and the soul speaking about the issues that confirm it. Now, these four messages came to me in October 1998. Forgive me, folks. These two messages came to me in October of 1998. They were the first messages, the first ones, in which God recognizes your concern about when I die, what exists. Listen to this message. And by the way, listen to the poetic quality because this is Elizabethan English that God uses with me. He knows my fond fondness for, for sound. And so when you hear the such words as dust the, that's do you or uh, does, 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 there, whatever. At any rate, dust means do, but it's in the Elizabeth, Elizabethan form. And it's just plain pretty to me. And God speaks this way to me, know me, knowing me and what I enjoy. Listen to this message and to the reassurance of it. Ah, my loves. Now, is that enough in itself just to reassure you of something? Ah, my loves. He calls you God, calls you your God, whatever your God is. If it's a loving God, an unconditionally loving God, the name of your God is not important. It's the qualities that's important. And here is the God that I know to be of unconditional love. Ah, my loves. Fraught with fear, fraught, filled with, fraught with fear. That's why we're doing this, filled with fear and uneasiness and wondering when it shall end. Yeah, what's going to happen, God, when, you know, my life disappears? Nothing? What's going on, please? Ah, my loves, fraught with fear and wondering when it shall end. 
Dost thee not know in angeled choirs? Now what's the angel choirs? A symbol of there's another existence. There are angels and we and the angels experience each other. Or maybe God is even calling us angel beings. Take your choice, however it is that you interpret this. Now let me again give you this confirmation from God. The fourth letter of Notes Divine, find it on the website. Ah, my loves, fraught with fear and wondering when it shall end, dost thee not know in angel choirs? Oh, that's the end, that's the end that has no end. You following that? All right, now that's the first one. Direct reassurance to you, immediate reassurance to you of the existence of yourself as a, a being, an eternal being. Now, how does God feel about you? And this also is so beautiful. Listen to this one. This is the fourth message that came on that day. God poses it a question. Wouldst not thee know of thee I sing? To have and hold on angel's wing. Now, are you in a body form or a spirit form? If you're in a body form, that angel is going to have a backache of holding you on angel's wing. So it must be that God relieves the angels of heavy weight lifting and you're in another format that God is expressing here. What's not the know? Don't you know it? Or wouldn't you want to know this? Because you, you know, you'll play with these lines, how you're going to experience them. I just write them down as I receive them. But how you interpret them, that's going to be your experience of this. Is God saying, what's not the know, as though he can't believe that you don't know? Or what's not the know, oh come on, let's get off it. Or what's not the know, do you want to know? Would not thee know of thee I sing? God sings of you. God sings of you. Would not thee know of you I sing to have and hold on angel's wing? Well, those are the first two. I'm going to move on because let's see if there's another one or two that here is this factual statements by God, recorded it as God said it to me, and put it down. <clears throat> this one was recorded on May 11th, 2000, and again it's one of the earliest messages that came. You'll find it easily when, when you look for it in the, the foot ladder. <clears throat> and again, Listen to the first line of what he starts off with. Ah, uh, my loves. Now notice he doesn't say my loves. He has to put that ah uh, before it. Ah, uh, my loves. It just makes it more intimate, more personal. Our God. Ah, uh, my loves. Wouldst not thee bring thy loathe of self to my healing spring? He knows we're in trouble. This is why we have doubts about the afterlife, that in some way we're down on ourselves. We can't believe that there could be a God that loves us or that there's a loving quality to us. And so it has a quality. We're down on ourselves. And God uses the word, we've got a loathing going on that we're not happy about ourselves, that there is a displeasure and he's picking up on this. He has to deal with this because this is why you're in trouble with having an afterlife or a belief in a loving God. Now here we go. Ah, my loves, wouldst not thee bring thy loathe of self to my healing spring? Wouldst fear of me be thy guiding light? Oh. God knows the human mind, our guilt feelings about ourself, which comes a fear of God. Wouldst fear of me be thy guiding light, 
thy ground, thy walk, thy passion stance, that you believe it passionately? Wouldst not thee want my assure? Wouldst not want, oh, wouldst not thee grant with tender calm my call of thee to rescind, revert, abandon thy useless, fruitless ways, and with me come on a fruitful path with love's abounding way. God's calling, please be with me, come with me, let me in to your life. He goes on. Oh, wouldst not thee sing with joy and glee with a heart aroused in me? Assurance, huh? Would you? Wouldst not thee want of me my song? His love song to us. The way to part, open ourselves up. The voyage end, a way you've been so long, this human existence is away from God, wants us back. Oh, come, my loves, my tender hearts, there God goes again. My tender hearts, that's what you are, a tender heart. Oh, come, my loves, my tender hearts, upon me thy depend. Oh, rejoice, my loves, rejoice at last, where pain has gone. You're over the worries. Where life arise, the real life of the heavenly life. No more the hurtful past, this human circumstance. Away you've been, my love, so long from me, thy heart of yours. This is us. Make of me thy stone, thy ground, of loathe would be no more if we are in him. Now here's God speaking of the existence of the afterlife. This is one of the sightings of heaven which you might want to replay, review, feel it in order to build up inside yourself the realization of there is a loving God who created us as eternal beings as gods and who God loves very, very much. Well, we're going to move on now to other experiences of the presence of God and of sightings of heaven. We're off now on a second example of the existence of the afterlife of the kingdom of heaven and its qualities. And for this, I'm going to talk of two examples of people who I know talking in the kingdom that God privileged me to hear. And the first one was of my Aunt Lillian, who was my father's sister-in-law, calling to her husband of this world, Bernie. Aunt Lillian, dear heart, was a marvelously rich, gifted person and an individual where we organized very firm about what she did and had an authoritative quality to herself that she had this. She ran that household, etc. And I am in bed that night and all of a sudden I hear Aunt Lillian calling to Bernie, my father's younger brother, and I hear the quality of her voice. Bernie, Bernie. This soft, gentle quality to the voice. That was not the voice of my Aunt Lillian that I associated with it. It was a very organized person very much in charge, but here is this gentle, Bernie, Bernie, my goodness, anybody who hear that voice would come running, including my Uncle Bernie. It had such a loving, loving quality to it, such a soft, gentle, tender quality to it. 
burning, burning. That's the first example. The second example, and I think that I have spoken of it before in some way, but it fits as well in what I'm talking about now, was from Penny, my late wife, that I had seen a picture of our wedding, actually a couple of minutes after our wedding. Uh, Penny and I got married in the Justice of the Peace, and um, the picture was of herself and her two nurse friends, Penny was a nurse, and her two nurse friends, and they worked in the woman's, uh, not the woman's ward, but a, the, where uh, when they were ill they went to, uh, uh, to that ward within the hospital, and she worked in, in, in that ward with them. And here was the picture of the three of them, and there was Penny held by uh, the, the arms of her two colleagues and the two friends around her minutes after the wedding. And she had virtually a sheepish, sheepish, shy smile on her face of this moment after wedding when it has, has happened. And the scene of that picture again brought me to tears because here is the woman who a wedding and the marriage is so important to them and looking forward with hope to a treasure of what can exist in. And Penn and I had 50 years of working out relationships with each other, that we had a struggle of our natures with each other. And I thought at that point, if only it could have been more loving, if only I could have enabled her to have a happier experience. I had those feelings and I wept when I thought of the fact that this was not the ideal lovey-dovey, uh, eternal happiness kind of uh, uh, blossoming in it that we would all wish for. It wasn't there. And then I heard Penny speak to me. Now, the penny that I knew <laughs> would have said, oh, Bob, cut it out. Uh, come on, stop it. <laughs> that pen would have most likely reacted in this world with it. I hear Penny say, weep not for me. Weep not for me. Now, notice that it's in a poetic form. Don't weep for me would have been in general conversational form. But she's speaking in a voice and with words that when you read the footlighter of Notes Divine, you know that there is a poetical form to God speaking. I mentioned that the use of Elizabethan uh, speech, and there is a rhythm uh, and uh, a, a sound quality to these, these words. And here is Penny now speaking in the heavenly form, the afterlife form that meets my needs as well. Weep not for me. Weep not the reassuring quality. And so we know, number one, Penny exists in the afterlife. She's alive and well and tells me that you, have, have, you don't have to weep, you do not have to feel badly about what happened, that there is a completeness to her. Those are the two voices that I heard. Now, in the third aspect of this, I'm going to speak of a different presence. I'm going to speak of seeing the people in their heavenly identity. We're into part three now of the sightings of heaven, the afterlife. We've mentioned the beautiful verses, God speaking to each of us and telling us of the existence of the afterlife and of God's love for us. And in the second one, I speak of the hearing of the voices of those who I knew 
and of the quality of the voices. They exist, they are no longer in this world, and there they are in the spirit dimension and with a quality that God wants them to deliver for you to know that the kingdom, the afterlife, is a loving one. The third one now is with people that God enabled me to look upon. And the first one was my late wife. And the second one was my father, my father of this world, Nathan Weltman. I speak first of Penny, of how this was shown to me. I was shown a picture, like a Polaroid print, which I found in the closet. You can see I'm in an uplifted state, and that God uses this state in order to present this image. And I pick up this picture, and it's one of Penny in her nurse's uniform. And it's a young Penny, the Penny that I knew when we first married, we were 25, 26 years old, in her nurse's uniform with her nurse's cap on. In those days, nurses wore the caps which represented the nursing school that they had went to. And so this is a picture indeed of Penny that I knew in when I first met her. It would have been in 1958. Young 26 years old at that point, and this was the image that was presented of her vital, alive, youthful experience, and she's sitting on a bench, which I identified as some way it was at the psychiatric center where Penny and I both worked. But the quality of it, the importance about it, was Penny's eyes. I was looking at the quietness, the completeness, the fullness of Penny. That here is the peace of God that was being represented to me from somebody who in this world was rather precious to me. And there she is. I knew she had gotten home. And this was her soul, represented though in a form that I could recognize while I'm still in this world of a human body, but her eyes were of the peace of God. That penny was shown to me to represent the peace of God. That there's no worry in it. All there is is the assurance, the well-being, the care, the fulfillment, the worth, all of these words are in this quiet peace of God. And that's our eyes, folks. That's our eyes. Our eyes. The second example that I want to use is that I had a vision of Jesus. This vision was given to me, and it would eventually be the vision that enabled me to move forward in order to be baptized and to fuse Christianity with my Jewish background. And so I was shown the image of Jesus' face gazing. Jesus was not looking directly at me. He was looking over my shoulder, off to the right a bit and somehow the leaned forward. But again, when I looked into Jesus' eyes, I saw this completeness, this all-knowingness, this intention to be able to bring to his children or her children, because God has been shown to me specifically as Jesus and Mary. This is the God that they wanted me to know. But I told you that you can have all different names for God, but this to me is the unconditionally loving God. And it was going to be my job to work within a Judeo-Christian aspect. And so I now look 
at the eyes of Jesus. And again, what I see are these all-knowing, quiet eyes, but who is out to accomplish something. He's looking past me. He's looking at something that he is involved in in some way. Not directly at me, but looking past. That there's something that I obviously am involved in with Jesus, that he wants me to know that there's involvement, there is this purpose that he has, but presented with the absolute peace of God, the all understanding, the compassion, the love, the, the fulfillment of a God who so loves us that God creates us in order to have an existence and an eternal existence. But there it was in Jesus' eyes, that fulfillment. Just as I had seen a peace in my wife's eyes, I saw this peace, but also an active peace that God was working to be able to fulfill something, which I believe, of course, was to get us home. And this is what I was looking at. Those are two images. Now I'm going to move on to the final point that I want in this segment, and that is my father's face. I was listening to a colleague's, or I was reading a colleague's songs that had been delivered to her by God and which eventually were going to introduce, by the way, to the Christian Lady Foundation. Uh, her name is Noel Polet, P-O-L-L-E-T. She hears songs dictated to her by God, and I was reading one of these songs, and all of a sudden, I'm not there anymore. I see a door opening, and I become curious. What is this? Who is going to walk through it? And I now see the face of my father. And it was the face of my father in his prime. Now, I didn't know him, Dad, when he had me, and what I can remember, in, if I'm four or five years old, which it would have been around 1936, 37, Dad was already in his later 30s. But I was seeing the vibrancy of my father's soul. And I looked at his eyes and people people, people. I had never seen that look in my father's eyes, nor have I ever seen that look in anybody's eyes in this world. These eyes, the fullness of what is being seen, and alertly seen, fulfillingly seen, these eyes so bright, so all consuming of what is in front of him, all receiving of what is there, these eyes that took in everything of the kingdom of heaven, of the presence of God, complete in it. These eyes were complete in the intent as well to be able to give everything. There is a oneness between my father and all that relates in heaven, in the afterlife, absorbed in, taken in, and given away. I thought to myself, how impossible it is to be able to live in this world with that mind that was behind those eyes. You would only be able to stay for seconds because it's all incorporating, it's all fulfilling everything. It is another worldly thing. We can't have those eyes in this world and stay here. The fullness of my father, who went in this world, suffered a depression in the last year, in his last years. And in those days, they would treat depression with shock treatment. And dad had a series of shock treatments to pull him out of it. And he lived a number of years after that without the further need of treatment. But there was a depressive element to my father. He was a kindly man, good man, very, very good 
to me. I remember the lovely times that he would take me down to Coney Island. Sorry, folks, if you're not New Yorkers, he would take me down to Coney Island and we would go to the playland kinds of parks that, that existed there and the games that existed there. I remember him chucking my cheek one time while we were waiting for a train to, uh, to come home from uh, where I worked at a, at a beach. I remember these little scenes. I remember my father teaching me pinochle and most likely letting me win when sitting on the couch with him. Little, little scenes like this kind of a thing. And then there were difficulties with my father also because of his um, difficulty of having a fullness of peace within himself. I remember my father, for instance, with my mother, and again, I had a soft stroking of her cheek. We were driving one day in the car, and I remember that he patted her, he pinched her cheek. Little elements, that was my father. But he suffered a depression and had to be pulled out of it and that depression was of this world. But I saw my father's soul. I saw my father's soul. It was shown to me as a gift, knowing the heartache that my dad had to endure from the sufferings from the human mind of how it clouds us when we're in this world, how it hides from us the truth of the fullness, of the completeness that we are, of the alertness the all-encompassing, loving, taking in and giving away of being one with everything and anything as God created us like God himself. People, that's us. We can't feel that. Oh, we can feel the peace that I described when I looked at Penny. We can feel the peace because when we go into prayer and we give ourselves to God and say, help yourself to us, we enter into a peace. And so we can feel the quality of that. But to feel the completeness of what that peace represents of the allness of our self created one with God and one with each other, God chose to use the blessing and the gift of my father who had suffered, and there he was, that this world just hasn't got a darn thing to do with who we truly are in the kingdom, in the afterlife, in the fullness of our souls. Well, folks, that's the best that I can do at this point of speaking on this topic of the afterlife and the kingdom of heaven, the sightings of it, etc. Love you. I should. We're all one with each other. That's heaven. In the fullness of receiving and giving to each other. And I hope in some way or other God touches me that you got a feeling of this. I would want you to have it. Take care, hearts. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.